heart disease, number one killer in the U.S. Over 600,000 people die each year from it, a lot more affected by it. Worldwide, the number one killer as well. And it's been that way for 50 plus years. Why do we have heart disease? They already saw the noticeable increase from 1900 to 1950. It's really been an exponential growth uh, since then. We said, we're putting all our resources. We're going to figure out what's causing heart disease. And here we are 70 years later. Essentially, we've made no progress. Our medical system is structured to take care of sick people. It's not really designed to understand why people get sick in the first place. That lady had been misdirected by the medical system. She had been seeing her doctor, she had been taking the medications that she was told to take, but no one talked to her about the underlying root cause of her high blood pressure and her obesity and her diabetes. Unfortunately, that then led to devastating, unsolvable problems. Do we believe that being on the right medicines is the best way to manage our health and we can't do anything better than that? Do we think that it's normal that 88% of the adults in the United States are not in good metabolic health? What would be those top three things in order that you believe lead to heart disease? It really is one factor that it comes down to. Dr. Philip Ovadia, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. Yeah, great to uh, be here with you, Ben, uh, for us to finally uh, connect. I know we've been uh, trying to get this together for a while, really been looking forward to this conversation, love uh, everything that uh, you've done and are continuing to do with uh, Keto Camp. Thank you, Philip. Uh, you know, I, I am so looking forward to today's conversation. I have a whole bunch of notes here. I, I was so excited just preparing for this interview. I the work you're doing is transformational. And for those who have not even heard of you before, you're in for a treat. And if you have heard of Dr. Philip, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I actually came across your work um, two years ago, not, not too long ago. And it was via Clubhouse, uh, that app that a lot of us were was on. And I don't know if you're still on there. I'm not so much active on there. But in the beginning, I was. And we were in the same room. And I heard you speak. And I'm like, who is this guy? He's super smart and brilliant. And then I just started following you and I, I fell in love with what you're teaching. And that was two, about two years ago. So it's cool to see that come full circle. And now we're on this podcast interview. Here's where I want to start the conversation. Heart disease, of course, 600,000 people per year are plagued with heart disease. Prior to 1950, um, it wasn't this high. What changed? And was it that our genes just dramatically changed in that amount of time or was it something else? Yeah. So as you said, you know, heart disease, number one killer in the U.S., over 600,000 people die each year from it, a lot more affected by it. Uh, and uh, worldwide, the number one killer as well. And it's been that way for 50 plus years. So, you know, when we go back to the early 1900s, we have reports from some of the leading physicians of the time and heart disease is an exceedingly rare condition. Uh, you know, like I said, leading physicians, uh, the leading hospitals of the time, and you know, it's rare. It just doesn't exist for the most part. Um, and then, you know, through the early 1900s, it starts to uh, become more prominent. And 1950s, it really reaches the crisis point. And you know. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower has a heart attack while in office as president of the United States. And of course, you know, that set off the alarm bells and people started asking why, you know, why do we have heart disease? Why has this? They already saw the noticeable increase from 1900 to 1950, and it's really been an exponential growth uh, since then. And um the question that I think is so important to ask today uh, is, okay, 1950, we declared war on this. Like we said, we're putting all our resources. We're going to figure out, you know, what's causing heart disease. And here we are 70 years later, and essentially we've made no progress. Um, heart disease, like I said, remains the number one killer by a pretty wide margin. And, you know, we had a little bit of an improvement here and there. Uh, but actually, the last decade, we have seen the rates of heart disease increasing again at an exponential rate. So our understanding of what causes heart disease, uh, I would say, went awry in the 1950s. 
And, you know, in the 1950s, there were two prominent hypotheses about what was contributing to heart disease. And they both had to do with the food that we were eating. Um, it was sugar is causing heart disease, or it was dietary cholesterol and saturated fat is causing heart disease. And for various reasons, you know, we chose to go down the saturated fat and cholesterol pathway. And we started making all of these changes uh, with the goal of lowering our dietary intake of saturated fat and cholesterol. Uh, and then it turned into pharmaceutical manipulation of our blood cholesterol levels. And this was supposed to cure heart disease. And it simply hasn't. And, you know, we can get into a lot of aspects of this, uh, but at a high level, when I look at that, the question I ask is, okay, we've done the things that successfully manipulated diet, you know, cholesterol levels, blood cholesterol levels, more and more people are on medications, we've changed our food environment, and the problem is continuing to get worse. And the only way that that can be is if it was never cholesterol that was the real problem in the first place. Mm. And so that's led me, you know, now to re-examine uh, kind of our approach to heart disease. And of course, this overlaps with my personal health journey as well. Uh, but thankfully, you know, starting about seven or eight years ago, I started asking different questions. I started coming across different information. And that has now allowed me to be able to do a better job of not only treating the patients that come to me with heart disease as a heart surgeon, uh, but also now my focus on keeping people off my operating table and helping them to prevent the heart disease from progressing to that point. And that's exactly what you're doing. And, and I love that. That's the title of your book um, and also the title of your podcast, which is uh, an incredible podcast as well. Stay off my operating table. Yes, that is the goal for all of us. There were a couple of moments, pinnacle moments in your career as a heart surgeon that led you down the path of what you're teaching today. One of them you talk about in chapter one of your book, a very young patient who had metabolic syndrome who uh, came into for surgery. And maybe you could share that story. And then after, you know, part of that was also some of the deterioration with your health becoming obese uh, in your late 30s. So if you could share both of those moments in your career and how that led you down this path. Yeah. And, you know, they really did intersect. Uh, and it, it kind of started on the personal front. You know, I had, I was a heart surgeon, um, you know, had struggled with obesity my entire life. Uh, but, you know, in my mid thirties, I found myself as a morbidly obese pre-diabetic heart surgeon. And I recognized that I was going to end up on my own operating table, so to speak. Um, you know, I was traveling down that same path that so many of my patients had followed. And like so many of them, I didn't know how to change, you know, the direction I was traveling in uh, because I was following the advice that I had learned to give my patients, you know, eat less, move more, count your calories, follow the food pyramid, all of the stuff that we've uh, heard. And it wasn't working for me and it wasn't working for my patients. And like I said, I was fortunate to start to come across some different information. Um, my journey really started with uh, hearing Gary Taub's talk at a medical conference, ironically enough. <laughs> and, you know, he at that time had just written the case against sugar. And of course, before that had written why we get fat. And it resonated with me. You know, it was a different idea about what was causing us to be overweight, obese, and unhealthy. And so I eliminated sugar from my life, went low carb, uh, ultimately, you know, kind of keto, now carnivore really for the past four plus years. And I am in the best shape of my life. And, you know, as I saw my personal health improving, that led me to ask different questions. Why did I hear about this from Gary, a journalist, and I don't mean that in any disparaging way, uh, but why didn't I hear about this from my medical school professors, my colleagues? Uh, you know, why was I learning more about the disease that I had dedicated my career to and was treating every day from, you know, 
engineers, computer scientists in some cases, uh, then, you know, I could get from the American Heart Association and the leading medical societies. Uh, so, you know, that opened my eyes to how our medical system is structured to take care of sick people. It's not really designed to understand why people get sick in the first place and prevent them from getting sick. Mm -hmm. And that is a much better approach because ultimately, no matter how good a heart surgeon I am, you know, no matter how good all the heart surgeons and the cardiologists out there might be, you're never as good after you have heart surgery or after you have a stent as you would have been if you didn't have that in the first place. And, you know, the opening chapter of my book demonstrates the problem with the approach of waiting till people get sick. Uh, because I tell the story of a woman in her late 30s with young children who ended up on my operating table with a devastating cardiac problem. And ultimately, it turned out to be an unfixable cardiac problem. And, you know, I then had to go inform her family, inform her children that, you know, she didn't survive. And that was preventable. Uh, that lady had been, you know, misdirected by the medical system. It wasn't that she didn't take care of her health. She had been seeing her doctor. She had been taking the medications that she was told to take, but no one talked to her about the underlying root cause of her high blood pressure and her obesity and her diabetes. And unfortunately that then led to, you know, a devastating unsolvable problem. You're, you're so right with uh, prevention, and that should be the mindset. It reminds me of the Einstein quote. Uh, he said, intellectuals solve problems, geniuses prevent them. And that is the best thing we can do is to be proactive. And thank God for conventional medicine, because sometimes it's it's so needed to save lives. You've done that so many times with your surgeries, but we don't want to even need you. We don't want to ever need you, uh, doctor. We want to make your job obsolete, right? We want to make sure we're yep. never on that medical uh, table uh, getting a surgery or, or just it, it's it's unfortunate because to this day people want to be healthy they're, it's not that they want to stay unhealthy they're just getting the wrong information and they're putting so much value in the authorities and it reminds me of and you went to tufts university so this is really relevant to you it reminds me of what we saw last year with uh, dr mosafarian and the food compass that came out and it's interesting mm -hmm. because this just happened today, and I'm bringing it up because it's perfect timing. I, I lectured at KetoCon um, with Dr. Mindy Powell's. We did a keynote lecture together a couple months ago, and I was talking about that food compass, and I was showing that chart, you know, as they put Lucky Charms and Frosted Mini Wheats and all these processed foods above, essentially, like eggs and, and beef. And uh, I, I got a clip from that lecture. It was like a 45-second clip that I repurposed uh, on Facebook Reels, et cetera. And I went on Facebook this morning and I saw that it, it went viral. It has like 1.4 million views. And I'm like, oh, cool. This is getting out there. And I wanted to see some of the comments. And I came across one comment and I screenshot it. I'm going to read it and then I want to hear your thoughts on this. But somebody named Daniel Martinez, I'm going to say his name. He, he said, did the crowd pay to get this terrible nutrition advice or was it free? And I was wondering what he meant. Did he think I believed in the food compass or did he think, you know, me going against it was the bad advice? So I, I said, could you please elaborate? And then he responded, please elaborate on an egg fried in butter and random beef parts ground up not being healthy. I can't help you if you don't know that. <laughs> and he said underneath that, you're just a modern day pet rock salesman is what he called me. I don't mean, yeah. so anyways that's 2023. I'm getting comments like that. So what are your thoughts on this? Yeah. yeah you know, and it, it doesn't surprise me, you know, this narrative has been so ingrained in us. And, you know, again, you know, this has been the narrative since 1950, uh, that, you know, saturated fat, cholesterol, fat in your diet, you know, which then gets extended to animal products in general is bad for our health. And, you know, so, I understand that people so believe it because it's the only thing that they've heard. Uh, but I also ask them to look around them and see what the results of that are. Do we really believe that the best that we can accomplish is that, you know, 60% of the adults who are over 50 years old are on multiple medications? 
Do we believe that being on the right medicines is the best way to manage our health and we can't do anything better than that? Uh, do we think that it's normal or it should be acceptable that 88% of the adults in the United States are not in good metabolic health? Um, you know, and again, these are the questions that I have started to ask. Uh, but for a lot of people, they don't even have the capacity of asking those questions. They are so trapped in their belief system and their information environment that they just can't see that there's another possibility. Uh, you know, I know many in our space, uh, you know, will often refer to uh, the Matrix, you know, the movie uh, as the sort of analogy for this. But it, yeah. it really is, you know, a lot of people just can't believe that there's an alternative thought around how to be healthy. They think that the U.S. dietary guidelines are the end all and be all. And of course, those have been constructed, you know, with the only goal of making people healthy. And of course, they're based on the best science and the best studies. And, you know, uh, and of course, they must be right because we've been told they're right our entire lives. And people need to start waking up to the fact. And thankfully, more and more people are waking up to these facts uh, that it just isn't true. Um, it hasn't had the effects that it was intended to have. And, you know, unfortunately, it's not based on the best science and it's not only guided by what's best for people and patients and their health, but there are other influences there that have corrupted that whole process. And that's what we need to continue to bring awareness to. Yeah, and it's exactly the point. The conversations like this, your book, your podcast, it, it it brings awareness to individuals so they actually could go and dig a little bit deeper like we all had to do, right? For me too, I, I believed in the government guidelines for quite some time. You did too, and it led us down a path. I was also morbidly obese uh, at the age of 24 years old, and I had, you know, I figured things out. I, I dug a little bit deeper, and this gentleman, Daniel Martinez, who commented, like, I pray he digs a little bit deeper very, very soon and, and sees the truth. Hey, I want to take a minute to share something with you as we take a break from the video you're watching. You know, one of the most common things I see to why people don't have enough energy levels, they have trouble building lean muscle mass, they have brain fog, fatigue, and they don't feel good is because of a deficiency in a hormone called testosterone. Now, testosterone is a very important hormone to have in a healthy amount for both men and for women. So how do you reclaim your vitality? How do you reclaim this very important fat burning and muscle building hormone? Well, you can do it with a powerful supplement called Upgraded T. It has been my go-to for naturally elevating testosterone levels. Upgraded T is from Upgraded Formulas, and it contains the highest quality of ingredients that have been proven scientifically to increase testosterone production. Now, as I mentioned, if you're a woman watching this, this is very important for you just as a man watching this right now. Upgraded T is a natural and safe way to boost testosterone levels. When you boost testosterone levels, it's gonna increase your sex drive, vitality. It could help replace fatigue with all day energy. It'll help you lose that stubborn belly fat. Uh, testosterone is required for fat burning, so it'll help you with the last five to 10 pounds that you're looking to lose. It helps you be in a better mood, helps with your memory and focus. So here's the three-step approach. Step one, take two capsules of upgraded tea with water every morning. It does not break your fast. You can have it with food or without food. Step number two, notice your energy levels and dominate your day with more confidence and more vitality. Step number three, wake up the next day having better sleep and just keep doing what you're doing. As simple as that. So if you want to get your hands on upgraded formulas, upgraded tea, and any of their awesome products like their upgraded magnesium and their hair mineral analysis testing kit, head over to upgradedformulas.com. And if you use the coupon code ketosis at checkout, they're going to give you 15% off your entire order. That is upgradedformulas.com, ketosis at checkout. We're going to drop that link down below. And let's get back to today's video. Um, you know, when it comes to heart disease, I know that it's multifactorial, similar to cancer and a lot of diseases out there. There's a lot of factors at play. But if you were to kind of rank a, a hierarchy of maybe the top three things that contribute to heart disease, and it might change in the future, so I won't hold you to it. But at this point, what would be those top three things in order that you believe lead to heart disease? 
Yeah. So, you know, it turns out that it's really not multifactorial. It really is one factor that it comes down to. Now, there are different things that lead to that factor. Uh, but when we're talking about and, and just this needs to be made clear, you know, because there are different forms of heart disease. Uh, but the most common form is what we call atherosclerotic heart disease, the buildup of plaque within the arteries of the heart uh, that can ultimately lead to things like heart attacks. Uh, and when you look at atherosclerotic heart disease, it really comes down to one major factor, and that is damage to the blood vessel wall. That is the inciting event that has to happen for these plaques to start to build up. Um, now, what causes that damage? That's where we get into some different factors. That's the, big the question. Ones, yeah. Yep. The big ones are going to be insulin resistance, uh, first, you know, and foremost, the, probably the most common problem today. Uh, smoking is another big one. Uh, now, we've done a pretty good job at cutting down on the smoking rates. And, you know, that ultimately is what led to some of the improvements we saw around heart disease, uh, you know, throughout the 1980s, 1990s, uh, and, you know, up until about 2000, when that downward trend that we were seeing started to go back up again. Um, and, um, you know, probably high blood pressure is the other most common one we see. But again, high blood pressure acts via insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. So it really comes down to insulin resistance and then other toxins that damage the blood vessels, smoking being the most common, but there are other things like um, heavy metals, uh, air pollution, things like that, that can uh, cause that as well. Uh, but ultimately we have to come back to damage to the blood vessel wall, to the lining of the blood vessel as the root cause of heart disease. Would you put vegetable industrial seed oils in the in the category of other toxins or would that be a different category? Yeah, so vegetable and seed oils are certainly a contributor to heart disease and I know again that's going to be a very controversial question, you know, statement because you look at the bottle of the vegetable oil and it has the American Heart Association stamp on it saying it's heart healthy. Um, but yeah, vegetable and seed oils contribute to this. And what's interesting about vegetable and seed oils is they also act through a number of those mechanisms. Um, you know, they are mitochondrial poisons uh, when we really get down to it. Uh, they cause insulin resistance. They contribute to insulin resistance. And, um, you know, the um, the fatty acids that are in those vegetable and seed oils, the omega-6 fatty acids that are in them in amounts that do not occur in nature, which is the problem, are pro-inflammatory. And again, inflammation is one of the things that causes damage to blood vessel walls. Uh, so uh, vegetable and seed oils, I do think are very problematic. And, you know, I acknowledge that it's hard to separate the effects of vegetable and seed oils from sugar and processed carbohydrates because our modern food environment combines those things. Uh, no one really consumes vegetable and seed oils in isolation. It's in all of these processed foods that have all of these other problematic ingredients in them as well. That's a fair point. Yeah, they usually come combined together. Okay, so you, you said there are several reasons why the there's damage to the blood vessel but damage to the blood vessel is the only cause of of heart disease but what ca what is leading to that many different things you mentioned insulin resistance smoking high blood pressure which is linked to insulin resistance other toxins heavy metals and of course vegetable oils which is something we talk a lot about if that's the case and i i agree with you then when the average person goes to their annual checkup with their doctor, there is no fasting insulin on that blood test. There might be a fasting glucose and maybe an A1C, but why isn't there a fasting insulin if that is one of the most important things to pay attention to with the leading killer uh, of disease in America? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, it's certainly a test that I use with my patients. And, you know, I know many other doctors who are uh, you know, aware of this now use it. Um, I believe the reason that it's not used in mainstream medicine is because we don't have an answer for that problem. So when, if you get that insulin test and you see the patient has a high insulin level, there isn't a prescription to write to bring it down. 
Uh, and that I think is really, you know, at the root, at the root of why we don't look at this blood test. Um, it's, it, you know, it's also very misunderstood by physicians. It's, it's really just not part of our educational environment. Um, you know, I think back to my medical school days and my training and, you know, there was no mention of insulin levels. You know, of course we learned what insulin was, what it does, you know, its role in diabetes. Um, but no one talked about checking fasting insulin levels. Uh, and throughout my early career, Again, I never saw a fasting insulin blood test done. Uh, and it was only, as I said, when I started getting into the, you know, this other information and I learned the importance of that test and I learned how we deal, you know, how to manage that problem of hyperinsulinemia uh, that, you know, I started checking it. But, you know, we can go back to, again, much of this work was done in the 1960s, 1970s. Uh, Joseph Kraft and Gerald Reven, uh, you know, two instrumental uh, physicians and scientists uh, who demonstrated this specifically when it came to heart disease. Uh, you know, Gerald Reven's work uh, shows us that over 90 percent of the patients who present with heart disease, heart attack or, or you know, uh, some other presentation of heart disease are insulin resistant if you test for it in the right way. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the key, you know, uh, but even the mainstream statistics point us this way because we know that about 60% of the patients who, you know, either have a heart attack, need a stent or end up needing bypass surgery are overtly diabetic or pre-diabetic. And, you know, those are just the late stages of the insulin resistance continuum. So um, no matter how you want to look at it, it's obvious that that's the problem. And unfortunately, mainstream medicine has kind of ignored that because they don't have the solution. Yeah, not yet. They, when they get meds for it, they might start testing for it. So if you if go get your fasting insulin done, that's the point. Let's yep. look at where that's at because your glucose and your A1C might be... It might not change that much for several years. Meanwhile, you are developing or you might have insulin resistance and your body, your pancreas is working so hard to keep those glucose levels in check until it doesn't. And then that's when you're diagnosed. But we want to be proactive, proactive not reactive. Um, what about the role of stress? I remember reading a book by a medical doctor. His name is Dr. Larry Dossie. Now, this is a book from the late 80s, so I know things have changed. But the book is a great book called Recovering the Soul. Just the title alone inspired me to get the book and read it. It's such a phenomenal title. But the book essentially is about finding your purpose, your passion, and living on purpose with that purpose, which I'm very much about. But I remember reading that book. And in the book, he talked about a study he was referencing. Late 80s, so things may have changed. Maybe it got worse, maybe it got better. But the study showed that in America, when individuals had their first heart attack, 85% of the time when they had that first heart attack, it was Monday morning between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. going to a job essentially they hated, the stress that caused it. So what is the role of stress with heart disease? Yeah, so we know that stress plays an important role in heart disease, and it's one of the pillars of health that I talk about. You know, the difficult part of stress is we don't have a great way of measuring it, you know. Uh, we all know what it is, uh, but we don't have that test that we can say, okay, your stress is X and, you know, someone else's stress is Y and be able to What about heart rate, heart rate variability? Would that be a good gauge for that? It, it may be, you know, and it's something to certainly look at. Uh, but, you know, I, I just kind of keep it higher level with people. And, uh, you know, I'm also realistic with them. I know we can't eliminate stress. You know, we can't all go... Uh, you know, live on the island and, and surf all day and whatever it is, you know, whatever that stress-free life looks like. And even that isn't stress-free, but, uh, you know, I, it's about managing your stress and making sure that it's not, you know, kind of internalized. But it's real interesting to look at some of the scientific studies around stress and see that, you know, stress ultimately affects these same kind of metabolic biochemical hormonal pathways that we're talking about and you know to see the relationships between stress and insulin resistance and stress and inflammation and so you know again 
it leads us to the same place. Uh, and it's very well described uh, that, you know, the relationship between stress and heart attacks. Uh, there's actually a um, uh, well described uh, cardiac condition uh, that's basically a stress induced heart attack. Uh, so these are people that have stressful events in their life. They have what looks exactly like a heart attack, uh, but there's no blockages in their arteries. Uh, and it's called Takasubo cardiomyopathy is the fancy uh, kind of name for it. Uh, but, uh, you know, it is a stress induced heart attack and it occurs in people who do not have blockages in their arteries in many cases. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, like I said, we know that stress plays a role. We see how stress affects these same pathways uh, that, you know, ultimately lead to heart disease. And um, it's a very important aspect of mitigating your risk for heart disease is managing your stress. 100%, especially in this day and age that we live in the last three years, a lot of people are dealing with a, a tremendous amount of mental, emotional stress. Um, so it's so important to, to manage your stress, master your stress, do what you have to do. You're also big on teaching sleep. The book talks about that. That would go hand in hand with stress when you're not getting quality sleep. You will have higher levels of glucose and cortisol, and it'll be a cascade of issues in a, in a vicious cycle. I do want to talk about what we can do in terms of uh, getting metrics done, some lab work done that give us a good idea whether we are at risk of heart disease or we're at a low risk because one of the most common questions i get being in the keto space and also the corn i love carnivore too on youtube especially is i started doing keto i started doing carnivore my cholesterol increased or my ldl increased now my doctor wants to put me on a statin i'm worried it's the most common thing i get i'm sure you get it all the time so what would you say to that and let's have a, a full conversation on the labs to get to uh, assess our risk of disease especially heart disease yeah, exactly. And, and you're right. It is the most common question I get as well. It's the most common thing that I work with, uh, you know, uh, patients on uh, is that exact question. Ultimately, what I think it comes down to is understanding the role of cholesterol in this process. And, you know, one thing uh, that I try to make clear to people is that it's not that cholesterol doesn't matter. It's not that I'm telling people to ignore cholesterol, as I often get accused of doing. Um, <laughs> it's that the amount of cholesterol isn't the right thing to be looking at. Uh, we need to be looking at the quality of the cholesterol that you have in your body. And again, we need to be looking at, is there damage to your blood vessels? Because, you know, I challenge anyone to bring me evidence showing that cholesterol in and of itself without damage to the blood vessel wall can be a problem. Uh, there's just no way that it can happen. You know, cholesterol is in our bloodstream from birth until death. Um, it is a vital part of many systems in our body. And until you get damage to the blood vessel and until you get damage to the cholesterol particles themselves, going back to the quality that I talked about, you cannot produce heart disease and plaques uh, in the blood vessels of the heart. Uh, so that is what I try and, you know, help people to understand and to focus on. Now, the difficulty is that's not how medical doctors are trained. Medical doctors have been trained to understand that all cholesterol, and really we can specify it, I guess, the LDL cholesterol mm -hmm. uh, in particular, it's all bad and it needs to be lowered at all costs. And like I said, that has led us to do a number of different things, pharmaceutical manipulation, dietary manipulation. And I would just point to the evidence and say, those haven't worked. Uh, <laughs> and in fact, the dietary manipulation part of it, changing our diet to uh, avoid saturated fat and lower the amount of dietary cholesterol has made our health measurably worse, you know, because since we've been giving that advice, really starting in 1980 with the first version of the U.S. Dietary Guidelines, our rates of obesity have skyrocketed, our rates of diabetes have skyrocketed. Uh, and, you know, with that, 
heart disease has not been impacted, uh, which is the very, you know, disease we were trying to take care of in the first place. Mm, isn't that so, interesting? <laughs> yeah, it is very interesting. So, you know, when people come to me with that issue, that's what we work on. We evaluate the quality of their cholesterol. We evaluate whether or not they have damage to the blood vessels in their heart. And we then work on manipulating those factors. Uh, and those factors can really only be manipulated by diet and lifestyle interventions. I want to get into the specific markers that we'll look for before we do. Um, question for you, because I remember when I first met my fiance, Natasia, eight years ago, she was working at a, a corporate job and she told me something wild. She told me that her company would reward, I think, the top 10 people who had the lowest amount of cholesterol with a bonus. Um, and mm -hmm. I think they're probably still doing things like that. That is wild to us, right? But they're probably still doing things like that. So are you more concerned with somebody who has low cholesterol versus somebody who has high cholesterol? Um, you know, in certain situations, you know, and, and really, like I said, what it comes down to me, uh, with me is the quality of your cholesterol. So I am more concerned about someone that has a low amount of cholesterol that's mostly damaged cholesterol than I am about someone that has a high amount of cholesterol in their bloodstream, but it's not damaged cholesterol. It's good quality cholesterol. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's what I want to look at. That's what I want to know about. Yeah, well said. Okay, so we're getting a full panel done. We're getting total cholesterol, which is, yep. you know, it's, it's okay to get that. <laughs> Just add it to the, you know, the lipid panel. We're getting LDL, but let's talk about LDL because we know that that total LDL is not giving you the full picture. So how do we know how much of that LDL is actually the oxidized small and sticky kind versus the large and fluffy okay kind? Yeah. So, you know, again, you really need to test for it. There are some indirect things that we can look at, but ultimately ask your doctor to get a, uh, it's called an NMR panel, or it will be called an advanced lipid panel. And what that will do is break down the size of these different categories of cholesterol. So understand, first of all, that LDL, HDL, uh, these are categories of cholesterol particles, families of cholesterol particles, uh, and they come in different sizes. And when we're talking about LDL cholesterol, we can really divide it into small and large particles. Uh, we call them small, dense particles, and we call them large, buoyant or large, fluffy particles. And the small, dense ones are the ones that are problematic. Those are the ones that end up in the plaques in our arteries. The large fluffy ones are not problematic. They're the ones that are doing what they're in the body, you know, designed to do. They're participating in our immune system. They're the precursor for many of our vital hormones like testosterone and estrogen. Uh, and, you know, they are not the problem. Uh, but again, the standard lipid panel that your doctor is most likely to get is only going to report LDL. And the standard view from the medical system is that we need to get that number as low as possible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you should push them for an NMR panel and, you know, you're probably going to get pushback. You're going to get told it's too expensive. Um, insurance won't cover it. Uh, one of the things they won't say to you is, I don't know how to read that. Uh, <laughs> but that's oftentimes a barrier, quite frankly, because again, this is not something we're routinely trained to do. Uh, the reality is, is that it's not that expensive a test. If you want to get pay out of pocket for it, there are websites that you can get it for about 50 bucks. Yeah. Um, it's usually covered by insurance in my experience. Uh, and, you know, and yeah, of course, your doctor has to know how to interpret it. Uh, although, you know, it's really not that hard. They give you uh, mm -hmm. they give you a lot of numbers. So it looks complex. But ultimately, they're going to give you a LDL pattern, they'll call it. Mm -hmm. And it's either going to be pattern A or pattern B. Uh, and basically, just remember, B is bad. Uh, B Easy. means that you have more small, dense particles. Uh, a means that you have more large, fluffy particles. And usually, they'll also give a number to that. They'll report an LDL peak size. Uh, but that is a key piece of information. Because like I said, if you have... 
a low amount of total cholesterol, but your pattern B and all, you know, most of your LDL particles are small, dense particles, that's a problem. Right. Um, and it's a problem that doesn't get fixed by the medications. Uh, this is something else for people to understand uh, that, you know, statins, if anything, they disproportionately lower the large particles. So actually, the data shows that they shift people towards pattern B or, you know, put them deeper into pattern B if that's where they're starting. And that's one of the reasons that I believe that I see so many patients end up on my operating table, despite the fact that they've been on statins for decades in many cases. Uh, and that's why I think statins are not as effective as, you know, they should be if it was really, you know, a purely amount of cholesterol problem. Well, there you go. A heart surgeon telling you the dangers of statins. That's, uh, that speaks volumes right there. Question on, on these, uh, particles, right? Let's say somebody gets the LDL, the NMR, the nuclear magnetic resonance test done, and they see, uh, at least according to the lab report that I look at with my clients, I believe it's 527 or under would be their considered optimal range for the small particles. Let's say that's around a thousand. Let's say it's double. So it's just double of what the reference range shows for the small particles. Yeah. But they have optimal HDL, optimal triglycerides, optimal inflammatory numbers. Should they still be concerned even though everything else looks good? Or should they continue to monitor it? What would be your advice? Yeah. So again, we have to be careful. This is where the nuance of these tests comes in. And you need to know a doctor who knows what they're looking at, uh, because that the number of small LDL particles that's going to be reported, uh, we have to interpret that in context. Uh, because if you have a lot of particles to start with, um, that number might be above the reference range. Uh, but as a percentage of the total amount of particles, it might still be low. So that's why the, the pattern and the peak size numbers are better numbers to look at because they kind of take that into account. Uh, so, um, you know, I may or may not be concerned, you know, if that number is high, I really then look at, you know, okay, are they pattern A or pattern B? What's their peak size? Um, and uh, that's, you know, that's what we really should be focused on. Makes total sense. So would you say that would be the best test to assess damage to the blood vessels? Or is it a full picture that we're looking at? Well, you know, we do need a full picture. And, you know, ultimately, what I say is, if it's damage to the blood vessels that we're interested in, let's look at that. Let's not try and guess at that based on indirect markers. Uh, and so one test that I think is essential for people to get, it's not a blood test, it's a scan. Uh, and it's called a coronary artery calcium scan. It's a type of CAT scan. Um, it's uh, very easy to do the test. They don't have to put an IV in you. You just lay down on the table. It takes like less than five minutes to do. Um, unfortunately, insurance won't cover it in most cases. But it's a very worthwhile investment in your health. And it's not that big of an investment. At most places here in the US, you can get it done for around $100. I see it as cheap as $50 in some places. And that's going to show us whether or not you've had, you know, whether or not you're accumulating damage uh, to the blood vessels in your heart. It's specifically looking at calcium. Now, understand, like everything, it's not a perfect test. Uh, because it's only looking at calcified plaque. It doesn't see the non-calcified plaque, but it's a pretty good screening test. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the most important screening test we can do when it comes to our heart health. Uh, and so you combine that with the blood work and the blood work also gets, you know, there are other things we want to be looking at. Like you said, we want to measure that fasting insulin level. We want to, you know, figure out if we're insulin resistant. Uh, we want to be looking at our glucose and our A1C levels. Uh, there are lots of other things that, you know, become important in this. Uh, but, you know, those are some of the big ones. And um, in terms of kind of bang for your buck, where I usually point people to first is if you know your insulin level, you have an advanced lipid panel and you have a coronary artery calcium scan, we're probably getting a pretty good picture of where you stand in regards to your heart health. Yeah, great advice, especially with the calcium scan. You know, if your doctor is pushing that statin, 
that could be a test you just get and you could show the doc, look, I, I have zero. Uh, and that's what you want, you know, the power of zero, mm -hmm. we call it. So we want zero on there. Let's say somebody does have um, a score of like a 150 or 200 on that calcium score, the CAC test. Uh, when you go on Dr. Google and you look uh, and ask the question, can you lower that number? Uh, most of what you, what I have found is that you cannot. Now I've seen with a few clients that it has been decreased, but I want to see what you've seen. Uh, is it possible to lower that score? Yeah, I've seen the same thing now, uh, you know, with a number of clients that have been able to lower that score some, you know, I haven't seen anyone go from 300 to zero, uh, but I've seen 10 to 15% decreases now. Uh, and more importantly, and what I talk to people about is I see it stop getting worse. Uh, because I think that's the real key here. If you're not at a point where you have, you know, clinically significant heart disease, uh, whatever your coronary calcium scan is today, if it's the same score a year from now and five years from now, you're probably going to be just fine. Uh, and again, we have the scientific studies showing this. Uh, but if it's going up 10 to 25% per year, which is the average progression, or if it's going up more than that, certainly, that's someone who's in trouble. Uh, so the goal really becomes stop it from getting worse. And sometimes, yes, we do see some reversal and lowering of these scores, and that's great. Uh, but focus on stop it from getting worse is really the first thing I work with people on. Some some practitioners say you shouldn't get that calcium score unless you're 40 or older. What do you think about that? Yeah, what I think about that is I now see 30 and 40 year olds oper you know, ending up on my operating table. So I think that we should be looking at this earlier. Uh, and again, you need to interpret it in the proper context. You know, having a zero score at 25 or 30 doesn't mean the same thing as having a zero score at 60 or 70. Uh, but if your score is non-zero in your 20s or in your 30s, that should be a major red flag. And I really mean non-zero. I see 30-year-olds with a score of five or 10, and you say, well, that's, you know, just a little dot of calcium. Uh, but, you know, that is a major red flag because that means that you've already had that significant damage and it's already progressing to these advanced stages. And we really need to stop that from getting worse. Uh, because you can do the math that if you're five today and you're going up 25, 50% per year, it's not going to be too long till you're in a couple of hundreds and you have significant disease. And like I said, I now routinely see 40 year olds ending up on my operating table. Mm -hmm. So certainly, especially if you have some of these other, you know, metabolic risk factors going on, if you're diabetic, if you're obese, if you have high blood pressure, if you're a smoker, uh, get that scan early so we can detect it early and we can intervene early. What's the highest CAC, CAC score you've seen in a patient? Uh, I've now seen, uh, actually, I saw one a few weeks ago that was over 7,000. Uh, mm, my gosh. I and what, the, do, you, uh, do you know what their A1C was as well? Um, yeah, their A1C was not good. Uh, that was someone who uh, had already started making some changes. So I believe it had been as high as like 11 or so in the past and was now down to like eight or seven or so uh, that wow. uh, that that person, um, you know, it, and it's interesting. Uh, I've seen scores as low as two or three hundred that actually ended up being significant disease. Um, I've also seen scores as high as, you know, 12, 1500 that don't end up having significant disease. So. You know, one of the things about the CAC scan, you know, like everything else, it's not as simple as one number to look at your total score, uh, yeah. because understand that what that total score is, is the amount of calcium that you have uh, in your blood vessels. But, you know, you can have, you know, one or two spots that have a lot of calcium that's built up very densely. And associated with that, there's going to be a lot of plaque. So that might be a significant blockage. Or you can have kind of thin layers of calcium that are really spread out throughout the blood vessels that aren't going to cause blockage, but you know you get the same score uh, when you total those. 
So that's, you know, again, why it's important to have a good doctor who understands this. I look at the pictures myself for all my patients uh, because I want to see that detail that, you know, the, the, uh, the radiologists, the doctors that are reading these scans don't really give you in the report. Uh, yeah. They usually just report the total score uh, and that's not enough information. That's an important tip right there. Make sure the, the practitioner reading it is looking at the full picture and understand it's not just the total score we want to pay attention to. Hey, I want to just briefly interrupt the video you're watching to share something with you. One of my favorite companies that I use for health and longevity and biohacking is a company called Bond Charge. And they have a whole range of incredible products, including the blue light blocking glasses you see me wear right now. But one of my favorite products from them is an infrared sauna blanket. That's right. Uh, you don't have to spend a ton of money investing in a sauna or spending so much time driving to a facility with the sauna. They actually created a sauna blanket that you could use in the comfort of your own home. And I use this all the time. Why would we want to even do a sauna? Well, there's a lot of research and a lot of studies showing the benefits of infrared sauna. The sauna blanket works by raising your heart rate to a workout or a training session. So you burn more calories while you're actually lying down and relaxing. You could burn up to 600 calories in one single session. Also, it's going to cause you to sweat. And one method of flushing out toxins from your body is through sweat. There's also one of my favorite benefits, this endorphin release, endorphin rush you get from using a sauna blanket. And I, every time I get out of the sauna blanket, I feel like I just got a 60-minute massage. And uh, that's because of the endorphin benefit from it. So how this works differently than a regular sauna is that it works by using infrared light, which heats the body directly rather than the air around you like a traditional sauna. This means you get the same benefit at a lower heat. So it's easy to set up. It's super convenient. 30 to 40 minutes uh, will suffice in terms of the length of the sessions. And you do that two to three times a week, you're going to feel amazing. Add that to your keto fasting protocol and watch what it does for your results. You could do it while you watch TV. You could do it while you read a book. I do it while I listen to an audio book. So if you want to learn more about the Bond Charge products, including the sauna blanket, head over to bondcharge.com slash keto camp. And if you use the coupon code keto camp at checkout, you'll get 15% off your sauna blanket. And actually any of their products are 15% off with that code. Bond Charge hooked you up. So head over to that domain or click the link down below and go get your Bond Charge products. All right, let's get back to today's video. Last thing on the topic of lab tests before we move on here. What are your thoughts on high sensitivity C-reactive protein as it relates to risk of cardiovascular disease? Yeah, so I think it is another important test that I, you know, I certainly check on all my patients. It's one of the better inflammation markers that we have. Um, and, you know, so it's, again, it's kind of a screening test. Uh, if it's low, that's good. And you're probably in pretty good shape. Um, if it's high, the issue is that it really doesn't tell us where that inflammation is. And that's where sort of the detective work starts to come from. You know, is that inflammation in your blood vessels? Is that inflammation in your gut? Is that inflammation in your joints? Um, you know, where is the inflammation coming from uh, is an important question. But ultimately, yes, we know that having a high CRP level it is a marker of increased risk for heart disease. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's a, it's a red flag. It's something that I advocate for people to get as part of that routine panel, uh, because inflammation, as I mentioned, is a very important part of this process. And CRP is one of the better ways of measuring that. Not the only way. And there are different things that we can, you know, start to look at. I now, um, with my patients, there are advanced markers that are more specific to vascular inflammation uh, that we start to look at, things like myeloperoxidase or uh, what's called the plaque test, LPPLA2, uh, or you'll see it called PLAC test, the plaque test. Uh, and these are markers that are getting to more specific vascular inflammation, and they can be helpful in certain cases. They're not, you know, they, those tests I kind of put in a secondary bucket, like 
They're not the tests that everyone should be getting routinely. But if there are warning signs, if we already know someone has heart disease based on a CAC scan, for instance, those are the tests that, you know, I now get to do the advanced work around, uh, you know, uh, figuring out what's going on, stopping the progression and uh, hopefully even reversing some of this disease. Great breakdown right there. I have a question on something that I used to, I wrote, I've written four books and my first book was in 2018 called The Perfect Health Booklet. It's like a really hundred page simple booklet for health. And I promoted fish oil a lot for many, many years. And then I started to really dig into the research on fish oil and I did a whole 180 and, and now I'm so anti fish oil. I know you're a big anti supplement guy in general. You believe you should get everything from nutrition, but whenever I make videos and content looking at the research on fish oil and why I believe it's, it's more harm than it is good. I get a lot of heat for it. And when you think about a lot of conventional cardiologists, they are recommending fish oil. And when I reviewed the Cochrane collaboration, which does a good job assessing different studies, to tell you if it works or not, they essentially said there's really no benefits to taking fish oil as it relates to cardiovascular health. And as a matter of fact, in some cases, it actually could create a higher risk. So I want to ask you the question, what are your thoughts right now on fish oil? Yeah. So um, I'm also not a big fan of fish oil. Uh, you know, I look at the question this way. Um, why are we recommending the fish oil? And the reason that fish oil gets recommended is because it's thought to be anti-inflammatory. And that, that sounds pretty good. You know, like I said, inflammation is bad. We want to get rid of inflammation. Uh, but the fish oil becomes like, you know, a pharmaceutical product where we're only trying to treat the symptom and we're not asking about why do we have the inflammation in the first place? So my, uh, you know, uh, what I would advocate for people to do is let's figure out what's causing the inflammation. Let's eliminate the inflammation. And then we don't need anti-inflammatories. Uh, and, you know, this can be expanded some to all these things that we're told are antioxidants. Uh, you know, again, if you're not oxidizing things in the first place and you're not causing inflammation in the first place, you don't need anti-inflammatories and antioxidants. Um, there are many reasons that I think uh, the fish oil question becomes so complicated. Um, you know, a lot of the fish oil products out there are manufactured in vegetable and seed oils, which are then pro-inflammatory. So, you know, uh, any potentially beneficial effect uh, is uh, causing things. Um, but, you know, my answer for most people is, okay, well, why don't you just eat some fish, yeah. <laughs> you know? You and, <laughs> um, you know, and like I said, get on a low inflammatory lifestyle and a low inflammatory diet, and you don't need the anti-inflammatory benefits. Uh, and I did air quotes there for people who are listening uh, of these fish oils. Yeah. I'm glad we're on the same page there. You're so right. And, and get the EPA and DHA through eating the fish, you know, eat some, some wild caught, salmon or some sardines or yeah. something like that, you know, you'll get enough. I, I was looking at what the requirement is, at least according to the NIH and the, the NIH says, uh, an adult man, six foot tall requires about 7.2 milligrams of EPA and DHA daily to meet its needs. Uh, their brain does. And I, then I looked at the average fish oil capsule. It's a thousand milligrams and people are taking two, three, four grams of it maybe per day. It's a, it's a super physiological overdose that is very, um, the body's not going to know what to do with it. And to your point, part of the reason that vegetable oils are so bad is because the way it's processed, yes, but also the amount of double bonds that it contains. And then right. at the high temperatures, it's attracting so much oxygen and it's oxidating. Fish oil has more double bonds than, than linoleic acid and vegetable oils, right? So it's like you're actually taking something you think is anti-inflammatory and maybe some companies process it better than others but over time it becomes inflammatory and it's just not what we want to do. And it, fish oil, I think is actually has been adopted by a big pharma. And now it's a multi-billion dollar com uh, industry. So, uh, yeah, I don't want to say it, there. It, it, it kind of, you know, becomes a cover up for the vegetable and seed oils, because, you know, when we do the testing of people's fatty acids, you know, uh, compositions in their blood, and we see this omega six to omega three ratio, and, uh, you know, we acknowledge that having too high a ratio is problematic, um, but we're so believing that, you know, 
the vegetable and seed oils are good for our health because they're lowering our LDL cholesterol uh, that, you know, okay, you know, that's where you're getting all the excess omega-6 from. So the message became, well, you just need to take more omega-3 to balance mm -hmm. it. Correct. And again, the real answer is eliminate the omega-6 and, you know, and your omega-3 levels, you know, you can get adequate amounts from diet um, and you don't have to supplement with it. Yeah, well said. 100% agree with that. All right, we're going to finish the conversation and land the plane with the question people are wondering. All right, now that we discussed how uh, the, the blood vessels get damaged, some of the testing, and we did a master class on what's happening there, the history of heart disease. Now, what do we eat? <laughs> I know yeah. you're a big meat guy, you're a big carnivore guy, but we see other plant-based doctors promoting that. So what are, what can we agree to? What are your, what are the general protocols we could follow in terms of? Yeah. And you know, this is what I really tried to do in, in my book, uh, is kind of, you know, clarify that question because same thing, you know, I was going through this journey myself and, you know, I, heard all these different uh, arguments, you know, go vegan, go carnivore, go keto, go low carb. You know, like I said, I really started with Gary Tobbs and go low sugar. Um, and of course, I had heard my entire career go low fat. So, you know, where is the truth? What can we point to? And really what I found at a high level is um, eat whole real food. That's what it comes down to first and foremost. Um, it is clear that since the introduction of processed food, uh, our health has worsened. Our bodies are not designed to handle this processed food. Uh, you know, one of my favorite sayings to repeat, uh, and I'm not even sure where it came from at this point, is humans are the only species smart enough to invent their own food and dumb enough to eat it. That's actually uh, for me, my friend. <laughs> is it? Uh, there we go. It all comes full circle. Uh, but yeah, you know, that's what it comes down to. So uh, true. You know, eliminate processed food first and foremost. Then, you know, your balance between eating, you know, whole real animal proteins and eating whole real, you know, vegetables and plants and fruits. Uh, a lot of that is going to be dependent on your situation. Um, I would put forward that if you're metabolically broken, uh, if you're insulin resistant, um, you need to lower your carbohydrate load as much as possible. And that includes the carbohydrates that are coming from whole real food. Um, I would also say that if you have an autoimmune condition, uh, something like Hashimoto's uh, thyroid disease that I see so commonly, um, you know, uh, and many others, uh, those autoimmune triggers are most likely coming from the plant kingdom. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, this is an argument for going towards a carnivore diet or, you know, doing a strict carnivore diet. Um, but if you're metabolically healthy and you want to have some carbohydrate, you know, whether it's fruit or vegetable and it's whole real food and it's, you know, as clean as we can get it, um, I don't have any issue with that. And, you know, in my book, I go through really all of these dietary strategies. I talk about the vegan diet. I talk about the carnivore diet. I talk about Mediterranean and keto and Atkins and, you know, uh, a bunch of others. And I point out that they each have their pluses. They can each be done in metabolically healthy ways. And each of them also have their drawbacks, you know, and, uh, you know, there are some pitfalls that you have to watch out for. Uh, but ultimately, what I come down to is really two questions. You know, are you metabolically healthy or getting metabolically healthier? And how do you feel? And if you can say, I feel great and I'm metabolically healthy on the food, you know, strategy that you've chosen, the answer is great. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, but if you're not, we got to look at where the changes need to be made. Well, for being real, most people are going to say no to that, those questions. And, you know, to your point, 88% of American adults are unhealthy. That was before COVID. It's probably much worse. And the, I think the majority of Americans also have some autoimmune conditions. So to me, all roads are kind of pointing for most people to start with a carnivore or a low plant toxin sort of approach as they heal yeah. some things. And maybe they could introduce some things back in. I'm a big fan of carnivore. I, I don't do it as strict as maybe you do it or maybe some other people in our space, but I'll, 
I'm primarily meat based and I'll have some lower oxalate foods, maybe some fruits, some white rice, things that agree with me and I'm metabolically healthy. But I had to get to that point. That is, that is the goal for everybody to get to that point is what Philip is saying here. But, you know, real quick on the topic of carnivore, as it relates to heart disease and oxidation, I've seen a lot of postmenopausal women and men who are doing carnivore for quite some time get higher levels of iron saturation and ferritin levels. And would that put them at a higher risk from heart disease? And what can we do for that? Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I've actually had a couple of people bring this up to me. Um, my observation is that the, you know, increased ferritin is usually a um, inflammation problem. And uh, that is one of the things that when I see it, uh, I become really, you know, curious about where do we still have some inflammation? And I think a lot of people, you know, who have started on carnivore diets, um, you know, still have a lot of inflammation to resolve. And uh, that ferritin can be an indicator of that. Um, beyond that, you know, if you've truly made sure that there's no inflammation and your ferritin is still high and we think it's a true iron overload problem, you know, again, I would say, it's not likely that it's you're taking in too much iron. It's that there's something amiss in the way that your body is processing iron. Mm -hmm. And again, we need, then need to start chasing that down. Um, we have been eating meat uh, as the primary part of our diet for essentially our entire evolutionary history. Um, it just doesn't make sense uh, that, you know, there would be something bad about eating uh, meat. Uh, so, you know, and I acknowledge that, yeah, there are these situations that some people, they just, for whatever reason, they can't tolerate meat. Uh, you know, they've had problems with their digestive enzymes. Um, you know, sometimes you have to do some manipulation. You have to play around with different types of meat. And that is something that I encourage people to do. You know, I'm not a kind of beef only carnivore. Um, I do think it's important to have some diverse protein sources there. Uh, and, you know, for some people, yeah, you know, beef or maybe beef that's raised or processed in a certain way doesn't agree with them. And you have to look at other uh, sources. Um, this can get pretty complex. Um, you know, on one level, I want the answer to be, yeah, just eat a, you know, animal protein based low carb diet and you're going to be fine. But the reality of the situation is that our environment has become so difficult to manipulate, to uh, manage uh, that, you know, some of these problems get pretty complex. And that's where you have to find the good practitioners to work with. Oh, so, well, so well said. Yeah, you're so right. You know, somebody who's been taking antacids for years, they go and they increase their meat and eat carnivore. They're probably not going to feel good. Right. So it's like we got to do something different for that person. And you do a good job explaining that. Um, final question for you is around a supplement. Now, I said you're not a supplement guy, but this one, you're going to love this supplement because it is not only anti-inflammatory, it automatically puts you in this amazing, happy state. And I call it vitamin G because it's the supplement of gratitude. My shirt actually says it there. So you don't have to pay for this supplement. And my question to you, Philip, is what are you grateful for right now? What are you grateful for today? Yeah, you know, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to be in this space, uh, to be having these conversations and to be helping people in the ways that I'm now able to help people. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it really, you know, uh, when someone reaches out to me on social media and says, I read your book and I changed my life and, you know, all of these great things happen, you know, that's that's what I'm here for. Uh, that's what I believe, you know, I was put on this earth uh, to do. And so uh, being able to have conversations with people like yourself, uh, you know, go to the conferences now and meet the people that are doing all the great things in this space. Uh, that's where, that's what I, uh, you know, uh, am most thankful for. I love it. It's, a, it's such an exciting time. And uh, you've been growing and reaching so many more people. Uh, and I'm, I'm excited for you. It's just the start. Dr. Philip Ovadia, thank you so much for coming on the show. Everybody, his book is called 
Uh, stay off my operating table, a heart surgeon's metabolic health guide to lose weight, prevent disease, and feel your best every day. You can see it's right behind him if you're watching on YouTube. Podcast is of the same name. Stay off my operating table. Anywhere else you want them to go, Philip? Yeah, you know, uh, iFixHearts is where you can find me on most of the platforms. You can go to iFixHearts.com, find out about all the, you know, ways that uh, me and my team work with people. And then uh, Twitter, iFixHearts. Uh, over on Instagram, I'm Ovadia Heart Health. Uh, uh, but if you just put in my name, uh, O-V-A-D-I-A, you'll find it and uh, really look forward to hearing from people, connecting with people. I love getting messages and uh, please reach out and let us know how we can help you. I acknowledge you, Dr. Philip, for your dedication and the big heart that you have, no pun intended there. The people you want to, the lives you want to change, the disease you're preventing. It's just, it's so important and so needed. I, I love forward thinking doctors like you actually care about human being. So thank you for coming on the show. I'm grateful for you. Next time we'll do round two right here at Keto Camp. Okay. Sounds good. And, and special, uh, you know, uh, preview in a few weeks, we're going to have you over on stay off my operating table podcast. So, uh, be on the lookout for that one as well. There we go. Can't wait, doc. Thank you.